Today's episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor and our favorite app for buying and selling tickets for sports and music. Go to SeatGeek.com slash BS to start using SeatGeek. House, did you have to use SeatGeek for the Masters? No, because Callaway, I did not. Gave, I had you, a Callaway gave you free access. Yeah. Yeah, I had access. All right. Well, for people that don't have access and, and the benefit of nice people from Callaway, you do have SeatGeek, so don't forget to download the free SeatGeek app and a promo code BS SeatGeek sends you twenty dollars upon your first purchase. Today's episode also brought to you by HBO Now, the home of After the Thrones, the Ringer's post-game show for Game of Thrones, starring Andy Greenwald and Chris Ryan. Game of Thrones launches Sunday, April twenty-fourth. After the Thrones launches shortly after on HBO Now House, you'll watch After the Thrones. Right? I can't believe two dudes I know are going to be on TV. I know. Three dudes, you're going to be on TV too. I know. I know. This is this is crazy. I I, I almost can't yeah. believe all of this is happening, but we'll see. I have my fingers crossed. Sign up for the Ringer's awesome Me newsletter too. at theringer.com. We're getting rave reviews. Just do it, and we're off. Yeah. I was driving into work today, listening to the Backspin station. Because I'm a white guy in, in my mid 40s, and that's one of the rules: is you listen to the Backspin Station, and you wear those pullovers with the half zips. Those are two mid 40s white guy thing. And Picture Me Rolling came on. I thought it was a sign from God. And now Joe House is on the podcast. How are you, House? I'm great. I'm happy to be rolling. Last day of the NBA season. Kind of a holiday. Yeah, great night. Lots of games. Uh, Celtics Heat. There's a, the three, four, five, six seeds are all in uh, in shambles in the Eastern Conference. Uh, the Warriors going for 73, and somebody's last game. I can't remember who. Somebody. There was one more game. Yeah, there's somebody's one of the one of the old guys is playing his last game. Whatever. Uh, House. I have my awards ballot for All NBA, and uh, I thought we could talk it through. Oh, you didn't complete it already? No, I get. I'm gonna mail it in after we talk, and not a mail in like it. Not <laughs> well, I'm a, gonna not I'm a, gonna mail in this podcast, so that's perfect. No, I didn't mean a mail in like what Dan Shaughnessy mails in a Boston Globe column. I meant like I'm actually gonna email <laughs> the ballot to the to the Ernst and Young NBA Awards people. So, uh, wow, that is. So let's go over this quick. I'm just gonna bounce some stuff off you. You can just be my shit detector for my ballot. Ready? Um. I'm listening. Rookie of the year. I think Towns, I think he's had one of the greatest rookie seasons in a while. I, I was actually kind of startled by how good he was. It, it it dawned on me watching Minnesota win in Oakland last week, and Towns kind of took over in overtime. Is it fair to say he's very C-Web 2.0-ish? Ooh, I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. The he thing that one, I He, he um, had one drive in that been, game in OT. When uh, he it, he was in like the three point line, he did one of those C web meanders into the lane, switched hands, kind of off balance, herky jerky layup. You you know that was like the signature C web play. The the surprising thing with that is we didn't get to see all of that on display when he was at Kentucky. Right, I liked his his general. He was always fluid with the ball in his hands um, down low inside the free throw line. But that that's a that's a complicated move that you, you just described there, that old C Web move. And he could post up C Web his post up game was basically the jump hook, which he would just do in a variety of ways. And he had a nice little fifteen footer, which Towns has. He was a great passer, so's Towns. Uh very good defender. Young C Web before he started having knee knee injuries and um I don't I don't think Chocolate City helped C Web that much, maybe off the court. I think maybe uh you know, I think he got into better shape. I think he enjoyed his, his time here. I know. I think I think he definitely enjoyed his time. Uh, but Towns remind that was the game where I could never figure out who Towns reminded me of, and that was the game where I was like, oh, this there's some sea web potential here. So I looked up um, rookies that averaged 18 points, 10 and a half rebounds, and had a PR of over 21 since 1984. Towns, Hakeem, David Robinson, Shaq. Duncan, and technically Blake Griffin, but he, he he sat out his rookie season, then his rookie season was the second season. Those are the six names. That's a pretty nice list, House. That's a great list. That's yeah. a 
I'm, I'm, my, I had to pick my flo- my jaw up off the floor. I'm surprised no guards cracked that list. Well, the rebounds. That's why. Ten and a half rebounds. The rebounds no is guards the thing, is right? Of course, yeah, no of guards, course. Unless Oscar Robertson. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that I've been most impressed by with Towns, and we haven't even talked about it yet, is his defense. The defense yeah. is the the thing that that um ha- is you, you can't really teach. You either have a nose for it or you don't have a nose for it. And uh, that was the thing I thought was most uh, impressive about him early on in his uh, tenure in in the National Basketball Association. But those are very mature offensive statistics that I you know. just described there. Towns is basically if C Webb and Rashid Wallace had a baby and that baby was allergic to marijuana, I think it would have been Towns. That's my <laughs> takeaway on Towns. I love well, that the, guy. Rashid has had a little more range, but that develop as his career developed? I think Towns, yeah, I think eventually Towns is is a forty percent shooter from three. And is the prototypical five in whatever this modern NBA is before things revert to the other way. Uh, the, the other thing, I, I think I've mentioned this on a pod before, but I don't think you and I have talked about it. About a month ago, this Timberwolves team started feeling very 2009 thunderish with the pieces they have. And I found myself watching a lot of them on League Pass these last five or six weeks. I, j- I just like the makeup of the team. I'm anxious to see what they look like when a security guard isn't their head coach. And uh, I'm just excited for the T-Wolves. Hey, congratulations to well, the Well, I'm fans. not sure. I, I have a question for you, but I'm not so sure that Sam Mitchell is not returning next year. Well, that would be a terrible idea, and I really hope that doesn't happen. I feel, uh, I feel very happy for the T-Wolves fans because – other than winning the uh, the KG lottery, even though he's the fifth pick, it's almost like you win the lottery when that guy falls to five. You get one of the 15 best players of all time with the fifth pick. Other than that, not a lot of laughs, not a lot of good times. Um, some of the worst GMs we've ever seen, some of the most terrible coaches we've ever seen. A lot of misfires, um, a lot of sadness. Having to trade KG, he goes to Boston, wins a title. And, uh, and finally, things seem like they're working out for the T-Wolves. The Towns, Wiggins... Levine, they're going to have another lottery pick, some cap space. I, I would love to see Thibodeau go there. I hope that's how it plays out. Um, Towns, I have Porzingis. I would not like to see Thibodeau go there. I want him to go to a different team. But the thing I'm interested in hearing your opinion on, what do you what, what turned, what changed for them six weeks ago? What made them all of a sudden more competitive? I think Towns got better. I think, he, I think you see this with rookies in their first season uh, post-All-Star break those last six, seven weeks, it could go one way or the other, and some of them just get better. I think Levine, the dunk contest, probably helped them uh, from a confidence standpoint. And and Wiggins is not a number one. I don't think he has the makeup or the mentality for it. But he's a great number two long term. If Towns is your best yeah. guy and Wiggins is your second best guy, um, you're in awesome shape. And I, And I just think... If you look long range for what the next decade looks like for all of these teams, you would want that Minnesota roster over just about anyone's roster. I think Boston's in good shape because they have all the Brooklyn picks. Um, OKC obviously with Westbrook and Durant is amazing. The Warriors are in great shape. All their all their best guys are in their twenties, but Minnesota's in that conversation, you know. And I guess it pays off. It's pretty stunning. This is probably the most time we've spent on a podcast talking about Minnesota. Yeah. Possibly ever. Well, I think it's, you know, they're where they were. I'm sure we have podcasts in 2009 talking about how much we love watching the Thunder, you know? So I think they're that's where they are. So I have Towns one, Porzingis two. I think he's the obvious two. And and, jo- and Jokic on Denver, uh, the center, who I thought was really good. And I'm amazed that he didn't go. I think he went in 41st a couple years ago. He got stashed by Denver. This was his official rookie year. Um, it's amazing to me that teams keep hitting these second round picks. You know, you'd think everyone would get smarter, but man, Draymond, who I'm going to tell you in a few minutes is my first team all NBA center. That the guy was the 37th pick. Chris Middleton was the second rounder. Jokic was 41st. Uh, Jokic, Jokic, Tate, is it Jokic or Jokic? I'm going with Jokic. Is Jokic, Jokic. You yeah, use the yeah. J? I, I'm so stupid with okay. names. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, the only other rookie that I really, really liked was Booker on the Suns, who 
is offense only right now. Yeah. But right. For how young he is and some of the decision making he's he's shown in some of these games, I think he is a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating prospect. What do you have you watched him at all? He's a real asset. He's kind of ruined their pick. They had that third pick locked up, and Booker just won a couple games by himself. And now, as we head into game 82, Brooklyn has a one-game lead on the third pick. I'm sure my dad's convinced Brooklyn's going to win, Phoenix will lose, and then the league will fuck us on the coin flip for the 50th straight time. And we've lost every coin oh, no. flip. For, yeah, we've lost every coin flip for a draft pick since, like, 1960. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Booker's good. So uh. Ryan McDonough did an absolutely atrocious job the last two years, but pick Booker. And the Alex Len pick actually looks better because he's been pretty good. So I don't know what to make. Ryan McDonough is, is the new Joe Dumars. He really is. He's all over the map. Great moves or horrendous moves. Uh, coach of the year. I, I, I'm going to vote yes. for Popovich. I can't vote for Steve oh. Kerr. He, he didn't coach half the season. It just feels weird. Like, I love Steve Kerr. That's amazing what he did. But he didn't actually coach for three months. I don't know how I give him coach of the year. Just doesn't feel right what do you think i like a name that you didn't that you didn't mention i like terry stotts for this i think Mm. uh portland really came out of nowhere i mean we had a a decent discussion about whether or not they were going to win 27 or 28 games at the beginning of the season they had one returning starter in 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 dime in dame lord lord have mercy uh and and you know they there was nothing as you looked at that roster that jumped off the page at you and said oh yeah here's a team that can rip off 45 wins in the west yeah i mean we we probably we made fun of them. well not probably we, we grossly overestimated the competitiveness of the west this se- this season but um i've been most impressed with with portland I like when fan bases taunt us by emails or Twitter replies that we didn't that we said their team wasn't going to be good when when it actually ended up being good. Like Charlotte and Portland were the two teams this year. First of all, the Vegas over unders for wins for both of those teams were like thirty. Like we we weren't the only ones thinking that those teams were going to suck. And if you look at Charlotte and you look at Portland, there's no indication that those teams are going to be good. It's fucking totally random. And we, we both were on Charlotte <laughs> last year, remember? We thought Charlotte was going to be uh, a, po- a possible out-of-nowhere team, and they sucked, and it was Atlanta that was the out-of-nowhere team. But I don't know. They, anyone who thought yeah. Portland or Charlotte was actually going to be good is is lying. Come on. <laughs> um, I have Popovich, Clifford second. Okay. Because that Charlotte I'll team's terrible. That. I don't understand how they how they could be a possible four seed. Um, but maybe they aren't terrible. He's getting the most out of them. Kemba's made a step well, up. I think Clifford yeah, gets credit for that. Kemba Walker and 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 Batum, the two of them together. Yep, that's been good. He so Clifford resuscitated Batum, or was at least uh, involved a little, and then also um, figured out how to use all their weird white guys. Forty white guys in that team. For forty big guys. Kaminsky, Zeller, Spencer Hot. Like he figured out how to juggle all the white dudes. So congratulations to him. Well, the, the, and an, an equally impressive MKG um getting hurt at the beginning of the season and them not missing a beat. Right. Which raises the question maybe that maybe that's one of the reasons they're playing well. Can you have a guy at that position who just can't shoot at all? Tate's kind of sadly nodding. We all love MKG. He just got to learn how to shoot. So, Popovich, Clifford, Stotts. You okay with that? Yeah, I'm not going to try and talk you out of it. If Brad Stevens had won the last couple games and gotten us to a three seed, he I would have had him in there in the second spot. But yeah, so I, was, I would not have apart. permitted you to have him sniffing one. Yeah, defensive player of the year, Draymond. I just think. Everything he does for that team is so incredibly unique and fuels their identity to some degree. His ability to guard all these different positions. There's just nobody like him. Kawhi's probably a better defensive player, but I think I'm in the mode of I just want to reward the Warriors in as many ways as possible in award season because this is a a once-in-a-lifetime season. 
So I'd rather give it to him. And I have Millsap third. Hey, it's nice to see Millsap finally getting credit for his defense. The guy's, the guy's been incredible this season and is really good defensively and does some of the stuff Draymond does, actually. So I would have him third. I, I don't buy the white side, the white side DeAndre Jordan just because they get a lot of blocks. That's, I'm not impressed by that. What do you think? I don't know enough about Avery Bradley, um, but I want to give him a quick honorable mention because of what he did in that game that Boston beat Golden State in, in Oakland. To both um, Warriors was, games, by the way. He's gone at Steph both games. Yeah, well, I I, I watched the um, the tape, and I'm going to – I don't remember. Who's the coach that has the uh, – that does the breakdown of tape and pu- pu- pushes them out on Twitter afterwards. Oh, at B-ball, that dude at is, B-ball props breakdown. That's it. At B-ball breakdown. Shout out I to that guy. I absolutely adore that. Yeah. God, I wish I wasn't so old. I would have. I would have come right off my tongue. I. He did eleven minute, twelve minute breakdown of that game, and yeah. I watched it three three times. And Avery Bradley up in Steph's junk all game long was a thing of beauty. So just quick shout out to Avery. I'm not. I know we're talking defensive player of the year. I just wanted to get get a quick shout well, out. For get, that. He's getting. I have to vote for all defense too. So I have Kawhi, Millsap, Draymond, Avery, and Chris Paul. It's my first team. Oh, so that there you go. First team all defense is pretty good. Second team, Jay Crowder. Paul George, Whiteside, Tony Allen, Clay Thompson. Hmm. There you go. Kind of like Jimmy Butler in there, maybe. Nah, I'm not. I'm not rewarding anyone from the Bulls. Sorry. <laughs> six man is the worst six man crop we've ever had, and this is a great time to uh, make the suggestion that I always have for different things, whether it's the Oscars or NBA awards, whatever. When we don't have a winner. We all know there's no winner we feel that good about. Just leave it vacant. Roll it over next year. Next year's guy wins two awards. Next year's six man, if we have one, he just win, he wins last year's trophy and that year's trophy too. No? Uh, that's interesting. Thanks. You didn't like Will Barton? You don't like him when, enough to reward him? That team was like 30 and 52. I voted that for That doesn't Iggy. have anything to do. He was a revelation, I thought. He was great. I, I mean... Yeah, sure. I had him second. I have. I don't it. like Cantor because, because I don't like how OKC used him, and OKC lost you know seven or eight games more than they should have. Cantor was uh, the sixth man of the of the year for his team and for every other team that was playing them, because <laughs> I can't even imagine how many points he gave up. Uh, I have Iguodala, yeah. Will Barton second, and Sean Livingston third. In, in my reward, the Warriors as many times as possible. Sean Livingston's stats aren't great. Guy was out there in a lot of crunch times. Um, guy swung a lot of games, gave them a ton of flexibility, just a great teammate, great passer, always gave them a really good 20 minutes. And the Warriors are the Warriors. So there you go. You all right with that? Yeah, I'm good with that. I love rewarding uh, Sean Livingston, who had a cup of coffee here in Chocolate City. You um, loved him. Remember we, when we the Warriors signed we him? We both went crazy because we we, yeah, we, we, thought, we was, thought he was good the year before. Um, exactly. Most improved, the dumbest award ever. Like, So would Tate be most improved for podcast producers because he was like an intern nine months ago and now he's been producing six months of podcasts? Does that make him most improved or did he just get a chance? The bar, the bar was very low. Let's just put it that way. The bar was very low. Oh, that feels like an insult, Tate. Uh <laughs> I have CJ McCollum as the obvious winner just because that guy has turned into like the modern day Sam Jones. His herky jerky, weird, crazy offensive game he has. Uh he can make threes. I just like his game. It he made the Celtics played them. We had three point lead, like a minute left. Timeout comes out. McCollum, they run something weird play for him. He doesn't even have a shot. He has some ends up with some fall away baseline jumper that I thought was going to get blocked and he made it because he always makes those shots and uh, I just think that guy's really good and also he listens to the podcast so he obviously has great taste <laughs> so Your shout out to CJ shout out That's to a, CJ he's a Patriot League guy right yeah and also shout out to uh, no. my old partner Jalen Rose because when we did that interview series two years ago three years ago for that draft CJ CJ and Oladipo were the two interviews that impressed us the most. We left the CJ interview and we were like, I know he's undersized, I know, but there's something about that guy, he's gonna make it. Both of us felt that way just from the interview. 
We did not feel that way after Shabazz's interview. Uh, so yeah, I have McCollum, Barton, and Kemba. But who cares? So all rookie, I'm only doing the first team because nobody cares about the second team. Towns, Porzingis, Booker, Justice Winslow, who's, who is what he oh, thought. Oh, yeah. He is what we thought he was. As advertised. Yeah. I, I, I would have been okay if the Celtics had traded every pick we have for him. Well, no, actually, I wouldn't. You tried but, to. Yeah, we tried. Once he learns how to shoot, that guy's a multi-all-star. And I think he's been very important for Miami and one of the reasons that Miami has turned into an intriguing sleeper. My question is, second, the second team, is D'Angelo Russell disqualified for starting this whole scandal on the Lakers? What do you think? Oh, no. I, I would. That gives him almost first team stat, stature as far as I'm concerned. For ruining Nick Young's What's marriage? better than... Okay. Any, any, I mean, taking a, uh, it, it, it's, it's too good to be true. I, I, it, if you wrote this, the script down and said, here, we're going to, we're going to pretend that, that this is something that might happen. Now you would get laughed out of the room. It, it has everything. It has swaggy P, a sullen, sulking su- swaggy P, a sl- yeah. swaggy P that won't forgive D'Angelo. It has, you know, the train wreck. Lakers in the most asinine season they've had probably in the history of the franchise yeah. with this, uh, you know, trot out Kobe thing and uh, the most stubborn, ill-suited coach in, in the league and maybe in um, league history. And I know this sounds like I'm a Laker hater. I'm not. I have loved every minute of what the Lakers have done this season. Yeah. The Angelo Russell thing was the icing on the cake. I put the young man right up there, maybe first team for what he did. And by the way, he can play. And yeah. when Byron Scott finally figured out, oh, maybe it makes a good, uh, it's a good idea to try and give him some time. The kid can play, and and he has, you know, he gets a little confidence. I'm excited about what what, um, you know, he 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 can do out here in the next handful of years in the National Basketball Association. All right, I'll put him on my second team, and you're right. Like he upstaged Kobe's uh, insufferable farewell tour for a week. I would like to congratulate myself for. Reining myself in for this entire Kobe farewell tour season out of respect uh, to a sport that I love and to all the Laker fans because I live in L.A. and um, I'm just trying to show respect. But uh, I just want everyone to know out there that I've been reining myself in for six solid months. And at some point I'm going to snap. It might, it might actually be tonight on Twitter during the farewell game. But that's all. That, that I just – I. I just can't believe the last six months. I just can't believe it. Well, look, I, I'm so disappointed. I, don't go too internet. crazy. I want you to have Kobe on a podcast. I'm honestly impressed that that uh, that I made it on today and and Kobe didn't because I'm sure Kobe would have said yes if you'd asked him. I should I should have him on the podcast and and ask him about the the fifty top times he's contradicted himself over the last five years, including when he used to say how he never wanted a farewell tour and to be celebrated like this. And then actually, that's totally what happened. Uh, Don't get me started. Hey, House, what is it about buying a mattress that leaves you feeling violated? Almost as violated. My back. Almost as violating as this Kobe farewell tour. Is it the pushy salespeople, the fake President's Day sale, or the fact that you know You'll regret what you bought as you do the walk of shame out of the mattress store. Mattress stores are depressing. Uh, well, thank it's God. the last for- one. I lay down. I wanted my, my back to feel good, and it doesn't feel good. Well, let me introduce you to Helix Sleep. You can buy a mattress online. It's customized for you for hundreds of dollars and not thousands of dollars. Go to helixsleep.com, answer a few simple questions, and Helix creates your custom sleep profile to build you the most comfortable mattress you'll ever sleep on. For your sleep profile, I I don't know if they have a snoring checkmark box, but uh, I don't think that matters with mattresses. You're just going to snore regardless of what mattress you're on, right? No, I I think the mattress can help, uh, but the angle of your head is the thing that really affects the snoring. All right. Well, with Helix, (laughs) your mattress will arrive at your door in a week. (laughs) And shipping is 100% free. You have 100 nights to try it out. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a 100% refund. No questions asked. It's almost like dating. You can just break up with the Helix mattress after 100, after 100 nights if you don't like it. If you do love it, keep it. Uh, and that's why everyone from GQ Magazine to Forbes are all raving about Helix Sleep. Go to helixsleep.com slash BS. Get $50 off your order. That's helixsleep.com slash BS. Um, let's talk about first team all NBA. Sure. 
It's a very exciting year for the first team All NBA. We have three locks. Steph Curry has to be on it. LeBron James has to be on it, despite the fact that he's been a terrible teammate this year. And uh, and Kawhi Leonard. I think those are the three locks. Um, I would argue Kevin Durant is also a lock. Right? Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The problem is— I'm not is, prepared to go— but I need to hear the fifth and before I, I give you my opinion on KD as a lock. Well, here's the problem. I don't have a spot for him. I'm only allowed to vote for two forwards. So sorry, KD. You have to go to the second team. Uh, it's amazing that he's not a first-team All-NBA, but I don't know what else to do. There's two forwards. LeBron and Kawhi had better seasons than him. Kawhi was on a better team. And uh, and I just don't feel right about bumping Kawhi to, to the second team. He's been the most consistent guy on the Spurs. He's the best two-way player in the league. He stepped it up. He's become a crunch time guy. He's the shark octopus. I don't know how he's not a first teamer. I, I'm sorry, Kevin Durant. Like, I don't know how you didn't win 60 games with you and Russell Westbrook. How does that well, not happen? Well, that's the thing. I think it's appropriate to, to downgrade KD as a form of teeny tiny punishment. They both get a slight downgrade because of that post All Star performance or, or or lack thereof. They they came out uh, in 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 a way that looked confused. They lost a bunch of home games that they shouldn't have lost, and to this date, to this moment, we still don't have an answer to what they're going to do with there's when there's three minutes left in a basketball game. And, um, you know, the score is tied or they're within a couple buckets. Well, you just described How can why, that be? You just described why both of them are on my second team on NBA. Um, yeah, that's where they belong. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't care who's making the list. I don't care what criteria you, you're using. There are seven players in the NBA who are better than everyone else, and I'm not counting Anthony Davis because he's hurt. But LeBron, Kawhi. Curry, Chris Paul, Durant, and Westbrook are in the top seven, whatever list you want to make. You can make the seventh spot. It can be Draymond. It can be Anthony Davis. It can be James Harden, whatever. But those six have to be in whatever top seven you make. Oklahoma City has two of those guys. How do they not win 60 games? I don't understand it. Both of them were, were relatively healthy this season. Westbrook was healthy the whole year. Durant had... He missed like one, two week stretch, but I just don't get it. I, I, I think for me, it's like, I, I know they're in a tough conference. I know the bench was a little up and down. I know Donovan was feeling his oats, but I watched them just lose to too many bad teams this year and lose too many games they should have won. And I never felt great about it. So I am going to reflect my disappointment by putting them both on my second team all NBA. Fair or unfair? That is 100% fair. We are in 100% lockstep. We're in 1,000% lockstep on that assessment. The thing that I think is is concerning for OKC, what is the difference between Scotty Brooks and, and Billy Donovan? I'm still look, trying to figure out you know, whoa, whether uh, Billy Donovan is going to rip off uh, his mask and it's going to be Scotty Brooks standing there, um, especially inside the last three minutes of these games. I, I, I haven't seen one thing that makes me think – that they're better positioned, better poised for a run in this West um, than they would have been with Brooks. They look to be, to me, to be the exact same team, super loaded, uh, super deep, still can't figure out how to win games at the end. And they've never figured out the fifth spot on the crunch time side. And we're in year five of them just not knowing who that fifth guy is. With that said, I think they're terrifying in the playoffs because they have two of the best seven guys in the league. And I, I would not underestimate them ever. I think uh, they might have another gear. Who the hell knows? I have Chris Paul as my as my my all NBA team because we can vote for Draymond as center. LeBron, Kawhi, Draymond, Curry, Chris Paul. What Chris Paul did um, to keep the Clips together and to keep them as a top four seed and almost you know within shouting distance of a three seed, just a bizarre season. Blake, they lose Blake for basically. 60% of the year, their bench is in flux, got Austin Rivers playing 20 minutes a game, and Cole Aldridge, all these dudes, Lance Stevenson, Josh Smith, and Chris, just another Chris season. I was looking at um, 
Chris Paul versus Isaiah, their first 11 years. Chris is 19 points a game, 10 assists a game, 4.5 rebounds a game. Isaiah was 20 points a game, 9.5 assists a game, 3.7 rebounds a game. Basically, the exact same points, rebounds, assists, stats. And you and I both thought Isaiah was the best small point guard we ever saw, right? Absolutely. Unstoppable. So here's the difference. Chris is, even though they shot the same from field goal, Chris is, you know, a 37% three-point shooter. Isaiah was that era. Nobody made threes. He was 28%. Chris, uh, right. Chris's career PER is 25.7, which I think is in the top 10. Isaiah was 18.5 PR. On the, and he made four first-team All-NBAs, two seconds. He's going to make a fifth one this year, I think. He might, he might be a second. Whatever is going to be one of the two. Isaiah was three first teams, two second teams. The difference is that Chris Paul never made it to round three ever in the first 11 years of his career. And Isaiah won two titles, made three finals. Um, the Pistons from 87 to 90 is one of the better four-year runs I've seen in basketball. And that's that's what Chris is missing right now. And I think yeah. it's sitting on a platform. The, the rings. Yeah, but like they have the, the rings now. matter. Yeah. But like Barkley said last night, he thought the Clippers were going to beat the Warriors in round two and was emphatic about it. And I don't know if he's pigeonholed himself into this anti Warriors corner, but you know, the Clippers could beat the Warriors. They beat him a couple years ago. Chris goes at Curry, fouls him 50 times a game. He's one of the few people that knows what to do against him. That's a winnable series. And this is, I think, the fork in the road season for Chris Paul because if it doesn't happen this year and they lose again in round two and it goes badly, they're going to have to trade someone on that team. You can't bring the top three back. So We knew that coming in. That was the preseason yep. story for this team. It's a fork in the, in the road season. And to, to Chris Paul's credit and to the point that you – just made they're going to end up uh within three or four games of the forecasted over under like you know it was 56 and a half yeah. was their projected win total this year we both like them for the over they lost arguably their best player um you know yeah, their best, their best front court player yeah for 60 percent of the season and they're going to come within a couple games of that uh win total that's pretty impressive i'm not ready though to to say that they're going going to beat Golden State. I understand why the Chuckster might say something like that. It looked like a genius if it comes to pass. But uh, and I really do enjoy those those Clipper Warrior games. They they um, come both teams come at it with a chip on their shoulder. They it they it is clear that they dislike the swag that the other brings to the table. I just Blake hasn't looked right to me so far. He's not elevating at all uh, in a way that looks like you know he's fully restored to. To health, what do you what do you think? I don't I don't like the way Blake looks at all, and I think they should have traded him in February. I think they made a mistake. I, I would have traded him, and I would have tried to get guys back who could help them this year because that window's closing. And uh, and if they got the right offer for him, I would have done it. I long term, I just worry about him because, you know, he missed his rookie season. He had a major knee injury. Um, he's had knee tendonitis, all kinds of stuff. He's had lower leg issues. Now he has a broken shooting hand. Just seems like there's some miles on him now. And just think of the history of those high price forwards, right? Guys that we grew up watching. It, he, he, the Larry Johnson fall from grace happens fast, you know? We've seen that with a lot of forwards, a lot of athletic forwards who all of a sudden aren't quite as athletic anymore and there's no plan B, uh, whose bodies yeah, break down. Yeah, it's off the cliff. Yeah, Xavier McDaniel. Remember what what a great athlete he was the first couple of seasons. It just uh, forwards worry me, especially forwards with miles on them. And I'm not well, saying other, I'm not saying other. that it's over for him by any means. I mean, he could have five more first or second team All NBAs coming up. I wouldn't be shocked, but I just worry that he has some mileage mileage on the tires now. I think it's going to be interesting. We will look back at this year's. Uh, trade deadline and what a dud it was and look at some teams and say, boy, you guys missed an opportunity. That's an interesting point you just made. I think you're right that Blake's probably all-time highest value was at that trade deadline. I think the same is true of Mello. I still don't understand why the Knicks didn't trade Mello at this trade deadline. Because he had no trade clause. That, he, didn't um, wanna, he didn't want to get traded. I think I think they would have. I, I just think their mistake was giving him a no trade clause, which is just uh, unbelievable that they would do that. 
I, 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 you got to find a deal there because he's, he's, they're not going to get anywhere near the value that um, they could have gotten at the trade deadline. And there were a handful of teams that he was going to, that he uh, was open to, weren't there? I, I, Melo has never proven to me at any point that he cares about winning a championship. I know they all say they care, but I'm just looking at the track record of his career. I think he's always picked money first and then hoped the championships would come. And you look at two pivotal moments in his career. 2011, when he just could have waited until the summer to sign with the Knicks. They had the cap space, and he pushed them to give up all of these assets to trade for him in February so that he could sign a bigger deal for them in 2011. That's a fact. Look that up. That happened. And then 2015, he re-signed with them for a lot of money when he knew it wasn't a great situation, and he knew they didn't have a 2016 first-round pick. And, you know... He knew by the time they turned it around, it, he might be 35. So I don't know. I I think he cares more about banking checks and playing in New York. And I think he likes being a Nick, you know. And if the championships come, they're going to come. But I I think he values playing in New York and he values the paychecks would be my assessment. Is that, I don't feel like well, that's a hot take. Do you, do you feel like that's a hot take? I don't feel like that's a hot take. Well, I, the, you know, the – the social media um, pictures of of whatever name folks were given that combination of LeBron and D Wade and uh, Melo and Chris Paul. What are they called? That's the Duck Brigade or something. Can I or tell you a something? Duck boat, whatever it is. I, I think Go that's ahead. in play. I know. Well, this is what I'm saying. This is the, precisely the point I'm making. If that happens, then then you have to you know say, well, okay, maybe he does care. And and it'll only be a handful of months since we're talking about him not caring, um, but under the right circumstances, that that would be pretty interesting. I think that's what LeBron wants. I think he wants the last phase of his career to be him playing with all his buddies somewhere, whether it's L.A. or Miami or whatever. I think he's, I think, he, I think his brain. Wait, 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 wait. wait. You you just came up with two destinations that were not Cleveland. He can't leave Cleveland again. Hmm. Okay. He can't leave Cleveland again. He could sure. get those guys to come to Cleveland. Okay. Don't you think? Sure. <laughs> You're telling me that the guy who did the decision and left Cleveland on a live television special wouldn't leave Cleveland again? That was that was five years ago. Okay. Okay. Sure. Gotcha. <laughs> Great. I just can't imagine it. It's unimaginable to me. Okay. He can't leave Cleveland again. I'm prepared for anything with that dude. Uh, quick LeBron thing. Right now he's fifth. He had another great season. I, 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 I'm going to get to my MVP thoughts on him in a second, but he was really good. He's been really good since he had the whole unfollow the Cavs thing. And the last fourth of the season, he's been awesome. He's... His per 36 minutes from 2006 through 2015, 26 points a game, seven rebounds, six and a half assists, basically. Uh, His per 36 minutes this year, 25.4 points a game, 7.5 rebounds, 6.8 assists. And his splits, basically the same, except his three-point shooting is 5% worse. But my point is, he just keeps having the same type of year over and over and over again without getting hurt. Um, I think defensively he's he's slipped a lot, mainly because of effort because he saves himself for the playoffs. But he can still, whenever he wants, he can take over a fourth quarter. He can put his head down and get to the line. And um, he's still LeBron, and he's still great. You know. So I, I'm I'm fine with him taking um, chunks of this regular season off. Me too. I'm really impressed – by Cleveland getting the 57 wins. Uh, that's one of our over-unders. That we had them at 57 and a half. Yeah. Uh, we both liked them under that because we thought, you know, look, the thing that makes the most sense for them is to not, um, you know, go all out and try and win their 60 games. Wait, are you sure they're going over? Games and... Because no, they, they could lose tonight. It's, a, it's in the balance everyone. tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, we hit the, if we hit the under, we I liked them in more of like a 53 range. But the thing about LeBron, and I, he, he had a forgot about Dre moment, you know, uh, against the Hawks yep, Monday night. I saw that. Holy cow. Yeah. 
He's still pedal to the metal LeBron. Like, hey guys, remember me? The playoffs are about to start, and I'm about to do some of this in the East. Get ready. I think he was acting so strange on social media because, for one thing, he just doesn't like playing with Kyrie Irving. I, I think he's just given up on trying to change him from being a shoot first point guard. Um, and then he realizes that he has the wrong kind of roster, which, of course, he put together because he was the GM. But he has all these poor power forwards and centers when in a league where you need perimeter guys. And I think over everything else, I think the Warriors thing drove him crazy. This is really the first time in 10 years that he wasn't completely the center of attention during the regular season. Now, there, you know, there's been some Kobe stuff. and But for the most part, every LeBron was on everyone's radar, and he was the main attraction to go see in an arena. And the Warriors just made him irrelevant. Who the fuck cared about the Cavaliers this year? I, everyone just wanted to watch the Warriors well, the, and talk about Steph. Part of that injury to insult was uh, uh, insult to injury, the Christmas Day game. Yeah, they they weren't really you know that competitive. No, so that's really what got, what started the, the 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 ball rolling. I think this is my completely uninformed uh, pop psychology theory. I think that's has got the ball rolling as much as anything on poor David Blatt. He went to Cleveland and thought he was going to put together this super team and be the apple of the NBA's eye, and then the Warriors decided to just steal everyone's attention for two years and. You, I thought one. You know, he has a lot of interesting tweets. Obviously, he's the king of subtweets. Um, one of the most interesting ones he had was during the MTV Movie Awards on Sunday night, about like ten minutes after the Warriors game ended. LeBron did not tweet during the Warriors game, but you knew he watched it. And then ten minutes later, he's like, "I love Amy Schumer and somebody else." Like he just he completely ignored the basketball game and did some fuck you Movie Awards tweet. I, I, I thought it was great. <laughs> He said it was yeah, just so petty. Like, come on, congratulate the Warriors. And then eventually he did the next day. But I, I think, uh, I don't know. I just think I, it's he's in a very interesting mental state heading into these playoffs. That's a shaky team. I do. They do remind me of the 2010 Cavs, where they lost to a better team. The Celtics shockingly beat them in six. And Rondo, for whatever reason, was the best guy on the floor for four straight games, and Boston won. I do feel like somebody can break this Cavaliers team, and I'm just not sure who the team is. Somebody can get them mentally. I don't think it's coming out of the East. Somebody can do it, though. It won't be somebody beating them. It'll be the Cavs beating themselves, but it's in play, and it's on my radar. Uh, Okay. A couple things on Curry, just quickly. We're taping this uh, like 2 o'clock Wednesday, so the Warriors game is about five hours away. He has a chance, if he puts up like 35 tonight, He'll be 30 points, officially 30.0 points. Right now it's 29.9. He's a chance to finish with a 37 and 5 with 50, 45, and 90 uh, shooting splits. 50% from the field, 45% from three, 90% from free throw. So 50, 40, 90 club. He also would be creating the 37, 5 club. And he's made 5.03s per game which we joked about this a few months ago, the, the 37 five, five, what the fuck club that's in play. Right. If he makes eight threes yeah. tonight, if he makes eight threes tonight, he gets to 400 for the season. Somebody needs to tell Steph Curry this because nobody had ever made 300 before this season. He might make 400. I bet he knows. I hope he knows. And then the other thing is, uh, he's only played 34.2 minutes a game. And is basically averaging 30 a game. The 1982 George Gervin played 35.7 minutes a game and averaged 32.3 points a game. That's the closest anyone's ever come to having their points and minutes match for over 30 points a game. 91 MJ was 31.5 points a game, 37 minutes a game. So just from a points per minute basis, this has been historic. Uh, he's clinched his reputation as the best shooter ever. He's had... 12 to 15 unbelievable moments. And uh, and then Curry and Clay together have made 8.4 threes a game while shooting 44%. All of it was amazing. And if somebody's listening to this mind podcast, blowing. if somebody's listening to this podcast 20 years from now, uh, this was amazing in the moment. It was an amazing season. It really was. It was so much fun to watch them. Uh, and then Westbrook has some weird stat stuff too he has a chance to finish with 23 10 and 7 
only done by Oscar Robertson four times in the 60s when everyone took 150 shots a game. On the flip side, right now, here are the three worst three-point shooters of all time who took more than 1,500 three-pointers. Charles Barkley, 26.6%. Congratulations to him. Josh Shockster. Smith, 28.5%. Ron Harper, 29%. And in fourth place, Russell Westbrook at 30.3%. He's the fourth worst three-point shooter ever who's taken at least 1,500 threes. Huh. So here's my I'm advice to Russell. By that. Maybe stop shooting threes. Maybe just go to the basket. Yeah. That'd be my advice. I only think of him going to the basket. I, how many threes a game has he averaged this, this season? He takes like he takes over four a game. He does? Yeah. It's that many? Yeah, watch a playoff game. Watch teams lay, lay off him by five feet because they want him to shoot threes. Uh, and then another weird one. Draymond is going to average 14 points, 9.5 rebounds, 7.4 assists, which has only been done by Wilt, Oscar, and Magic in 1982. And on top of it, he's the best defensive player in the league. How about that? Some pretty good stat stuff this season. Um uh, that was your that's really your take? I need you to be more surprised than it's a pretty good stat stuff this season. <laughs> You suck ass. The Draymond one is crazy. The, the only one I would have guessed that r- could rival that is Magic. Durant is averaging 27.4 points a game for his career. Where do you think that puts him all time? Top five. Third. Last, Third. Last, yeah, so inside the top five. Last seven seasons, he's averaging 29 and 8. With 49, 39, I swear 80, to God. 49, 39, 89 splits. He's almost a 50, 40, 90 guy for the last seven seasons. I don't care about anything. I'm just so happy he played this whole season. Me he's too. healthy. He's, he's, he's back. He's aggressive. He looks great. He's not tentative. That's the only thing that I care about. I'm so happy that, that he um, had a great season this season and he played you know as many games as he played. Me too. And if he signs with the Celtics, I'm going to have an orgasm on a podcast. I'm actually going to have one. He's not I'm signing. Have like a legitimate he's not orgasm. signing with anybody but OKC okay. this off season, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's see how the second round goes. That's what he's doing. Let's see how the second round goes. Uh, second team All right. on NBA: Durant and Westbrook. We have discussed. Paul Millsap. He's on my second team All NBA team. I think he's been awesome this season. He 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 murdered the Celtics. On Saturday night, he murdered us. He he annihilated us. He took a machete out and he started hacking our players. That's what he did. Uh, guards Westbrook and Kyle Lowry. I gotta give Kyle Lowry credit. He's the best player on a two seed, right? Oh, I he he deserves it. My center is Lamarcus Aldridge. I'm cheating. Uh, I don't like that. Why? Talk that me is out cheating. of it. Well, I, I don't have uh, a replacement that, that that comes to mind. Just put him in at one of the forward spots. I don't want to. I want to make him my center. I don't want to. I don't want to make DeAndre Jordan or Hassan Whiteside or Boogie Cousins, who is a chemistry disaster. I'm not making them my second team All NBA center. I'm sorry. Why do I have to do that? Why can't I pick Lamarcus Aldridge? That team's going to go 67 and 15. They were almost undefeated at home. He was their crunch time guy with Kawhi. I can't pick him. Okay, I'll let you pick him. Well, give me another option. I'm not going to argue it. Give me another option. I, 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 I don't because it would have been somebody like Boogie, and I don't like it either. It's very unsatisfying. Yeah, that's my point. So we're, we're, we're aligned. All right, speaking of— uh, We're aligned. We, we talked about unsatisfying. Here's something that's been very satisfying. Uh, the Ringer's relationship with MailChimp. If you're just started, oh. getting started or if you're already building a growing business, you know, like The Ringer— MailChimp makes it easy to connect with your customers and sell more stuff. It's totally free to get started. No expiring trial, no credit card required. Um, We've been using MailChimp now for, I think this is closing in on the end of our second month. We use them to launch our new newsletter. We do that newsletter three to four times a week. We are over 175,000 subscriptions, heading toward 200, we're getting there. Uh, Incredible read through rate and, and we love working with their technology it's been great when we start sending you emails 
about our 20% off BSPN t-shirts. It's going to be with MailChimp. We're not doing that. BSPN t-shirts? I want one. No, we're not doing that. Uh, I, I don't think I'm, I'm making one. I don't think legally we can do that. Uh, but thanks to MailChimp. What? Thanks to MailChimp for helping me and everyone at The Ringer build our audience. Incredibly easy to use. And you know what? Newsletters are pretty valuable. It's kind of come around, right? Newsletters for a while were valuable, then they weren't. And now it, there's so much content on the internet. Um, I like getting newsletters. I subscribe to a bunch of them, including um, including The Ringers, because it makes sense for me to subscribe to that one. Uh, but check them out at MailChimp.com. Great product. We love working with them. So, um, here, so you're with me on second team All NBA. You're okay with Aldridge. Here's my third team. Yeah. Paul George, Clay Thompson. Again, I'm rewarding the Warriors. And for anyone who doesn't think Clay Thompson's on one of these teams, come on. Like that, that the the shooting of Curry and Clay. And Draymond's defense are the three reasons this team's going to break the record. I'm rewarding them. I'm sorry. Go shoot me. Uh, I have Towns as my center. How about that? Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yes, no, maybe. He, you know, he's – it's funny. You and I, if we were doing trade value right now, would have him top 15. Oh, we'd have him top – So I'm trying to – Top like seven. Yeah, right. How so many I'm trying team, to come up with this? an argument. Who would Minnesota trade Towns for? Curry. Okay. Kawhi? Maybe what? Westbrook? Kawhi. Yes, they would trade him for Kawhi. Would you trade him would for... Would they trade him for Kawhi? I don't know. Would you trade him for Durant? Right now, okay, so he's like, we'll give you Durant for Towns. No, no, no. No chance. Yeah, because no you chance don't know you're going him. I think he's in right. like the top five for trade value. That'll be another podcast. The Knicks fans are like, we wouldn't trade it for Porzingis. Uh, <laughs> don't bring the singer up. He's number one. So I have Towns as my center. Dame Lillard has to be on third team on NBA. That, I can't believe that team's a five seed. And he's made a ton of big shots for them. I'm just putting him on. I'm sorry. He's going on there. James Harden. I hate doing it. I wanted to talk to you about this. I just hate rewarding him for showing up fat and out of shape and playing himself in, in shape and for uh, getting his coach fired and for being not a great teammate. He kind of ball hogs it. I think he has to get at least a little blame for the fact that Dwight Howard doesn't give a shit because I'm not sure I would give a shit either if I shot four times a game, isn't it? I mean, what's the rule of basketball? Fundamentally, the rule of basketball is to take care of the center, take care of the big guy, make sure he's happy, feed the well, beast. Just make sure everybody's happy, yeah. right? You yeah. want everybody to be happy. Right. So James Harden that's doesn't the, do that's that. That's at the heart of it. I don't feel like James Harden does that. Well, it, it worked last season and it didn't work this season. I don't have a good explanation for it. He gets partial blame for Dwight not being happy. I, I feel like... If I'm on that Rockets team, I just want to make sure Dwight shoots ten times a game. Because I know I'm he I know he's gonna care if he's involved. And if he's not involved and he's just running up and down the court and getting rebounds, he's gonna check out, which is exactly what he did. So um now here's the I think it's it's proper punishment for him to go from, you know, in the MVP conversation last season to third team all NBA. That's the right sort of drop. And that's reflective of his effort this season and the, the impact of that effort on the overall chemistry of that team and, honestly, the direction of the franchise because they have to make a couple more moves yet. Dwight's got to go. And, you know, it's, it, it's where this all shakes out is, you know, uh, a, a million miles away uh, in terms of w who they land and, and what they can get under the salary cap and all the assets that they have. And who's running the team? He has to bear resp some responsibility for that. And who's running the team? Yeah, all of those things. All of those things. I, I think there's like a twenty coach and GM. There's a twenty percent chance that next year we're doing this podcast and it's a three man with Daryl Morey. I understand. Yeah, although I we really hope that he gets hired immediately because he's done a great job. I I don't think this is well. Been if a he gets season. fired, I swear to God, if he doesn't, if Washington doesn't hire him immediately, even though. Yeah. It remains to be seen what happens with the GM here in Washington. 
If we don't get if Maury's available and we don't have Tibbs and Maury, I'll, I would I would be I would be upset. So since the All-Star break, Harden has averaged thirty nine and six, thirty points, nine re, nine uh, nine assists, six rebounds. Um, for the season, twenty eight point five points, seven point five assists, six rebounds. The only other guys who have done that: Oscar, LeBron, and Jordan. Oscar in 1968, the only guy in a losing team that put up those numbers. Um, he has taken 820 plus free throws in back to back years, over 10 a game. He's made over 700 free throws last year and this year, both of which are in the top 15 all time. He's also turned the ball over 370 times and counting. Um, the most ever by an NBA player. George McGinnis's unbreakable ABA record of 422 turnovers will never be broken. But Harden at least sniffed it. Um, <laughs> McGinnis had 422, 401, and 393 in back-to-back-to-back years. God. Yeah. That's, a, that's astonishing. Yeah, 1,200-plus turnovers in three years. That'll never be matched. Here's the other thing. This is ultimately why I put Harden in the third team. He's going to play almost 3,100 minutes. If he plays like 37 minutes tonight, he gets to 3,100, I think. Um, no, he's it's 250 more minutes than everyone else. The guy has, you know, he's done a pretty big workload in a league where everybody's resting and taking nights off or you're getting cut minutes. Like the Golden State guys play 33, 34 minutes a game. Harden has to play 40 to 41 minutes a game now just to get them into the playoffs. And Well, uh, that's the point. He has to play those minutes because he didn't work out over the summer. He could have played less. True. If he'd come and shown up in shape and with the right um, frame of mind and the right energy for the team to pick up where they left off last year. Instead, he has to carry this huge workload just for them to have the chance at, at, at making the playoffs, and it's still in, in doubt tonight. I mean, I, I think ultimately they're, they're, they'll win, and Utah won't, and uh, I feel bad for Utah because Utah deserved better. But, um, you know, credit to Harden. He deserves that third-team All-NBA spot. I feel bad. I feel bad for Utah just because of the team they're putting out. Did you see that team in the must-win game against Dallas when Favors got hurt and Gobert got hurt and the team they actually had out in crunch time? Um, I just felt bad for everybody. The yeah, Joe I mean, Engels, you know, Joe you Engels and Shelvin Mack were out there. You can't have guys get hurt. This is the thing. This is what made. This season here in Washington, um, so dispiriting. Many nights I felt like I was watching a D-League team because the replacement-level players are exactly that. They're replacement-level players. Their PER is 0.00 because they're not, they're not uh, anything special. They're, they're you know NBA uh, journeyman-level players, and there are a lot of teams that have that you know, sitting on the bench, right. Utah unfortunately being one of them. They would have been better off just throwing away the season and, and trying to get a top 10 pick, which is basically the same spot the Celtics were in last year. It was admirable they went for it, but it's too bad. All right, so uh, here are my teams again. LeBron, Kawhi, Draymond, Curry, CP3, first team. Durant, Millsap, Aldridge, Westbrook, Lowry, second team. Paul George, nice comeback season for Paul George. Quick shout-out to him, by the way. Uh, Clay And the Pacers. Yeah. Eh, they they had some bad losses. I don't know what to make of that team. Paul George, Clay Thompson, Towns, Lillard, James Harden. So there you go. Uh, MVP. I have Curry one, obviously. Who would you put second, LeBron or yeah. Kawhi? I've changed this. LeBron versus Kawhi, I've changed 100 times. It's got to be Kawhi. Yeah, and that's where I landed. You know why? Just because. Better team. If you're just talking pure performance, LeBron's probably second. But I think LeBron did a lot of weird off the court stuff this year that I have to penalize him for. I'm sorry, LeBron. Just have it's to. fine to go ahead and penalize him now. We we have um, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt um, proof that he doesn't like play, playing with Kyrie. You made that point earlier, and I think it's okay to go ahead and give him a slight downgrade in the MVP voting. Yeah, or on, on that basis. Tate, you okay with that? Yeah, for sure. Joe Fuentes, you okay with that? Yep. Would you guys like working with LeBron James? Just curious. Day day in day out, would you like having him at the ringer doing the stuff that he does? Based on the Blaze pizza, yes. 
Oh, Joe says yes because of the Blaze Pizza. Tate's 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 a big chemistry guy. Tate cares about chemistry and whether you went to Duke or not. Yeah. So this Duke guy. this Cavs team is a perfect storm of things he hates. All right. So uh, Curry first, Kawhi second, LeBron third, Draymond Green fourth. Everybody can fuck off. That's how I'm picking. I'm giving my fourth spot to Draymond <laughs> Green. That this is you're fired up today. That's probably the tenth f bomb of this podcast. Yeah. It's a conversation for it's mature. Bomb end of the season ender. Draymond was the alpha dog along with Curry of that team. I think he supplied the extra alpha dogness that Curry needed. Um, he single handedly just won games for them that they should have lost, including Saturday night that Memphis game when he just started doing Draymond stuff with three minutes. He just wouldn't let him lose, and he did that over and over again this season. Uh, there's nobody like him. If you switched anybody with him on that team, they're not as good. It, incredible. Like just bizarre offensive season that we talked about earlier, and uh, I, I just don't understand how he's not in a top five of an MVP ballot. I have him fourth. I have CP three fifth because of that weird clip season. How he kept everyone together. I would put Durant and Westbrook probably sixth and seventh to be honest, but they didn't crack. The oh, top you would. Five. I would do five A, B, and C. I would do CP three five A, and the other two five B and five C. Well, you're only allowed to vote for the top five. Oh, I see. And uh, I would have D'Angelo Russell last, and I would have Kobe Bryant second to last. <laughs> Why does D'Angelo have to be last? I was Nah, you're right. He doesn't. There are other people Kobe's that should last. be last. <laughs> like everyone in Philadelphia. So anyway, those are my picks. What do you think? I like them. I, I'm, I'm kind of stunned. I want to come up with... Um... A reason to keep KAT out, but I can't come up with it. Good. He was so impressive over the last six weeks. And all of a sudden now, he really is, you know, we just did the trade value. We did a quick hot, quick take on that. He's a top 15 player in the league. I mean, it's 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 pretty great. What a great moment for Minnesota. Yeah, this is awesome. That's why the big winner of this season where uh, everyone involved with every aspect of the Warriors, um, Greg Popovich yet again. And I think Minnesota. I think that's my top three. Minnesota has hope. There's hope of Minneapolis. Minnesota now watch has the, hope. Now watch the team move. So thanks to Helix.com. Why wouldn't you buy a mattress online customized for you for $100 instead of thousands? It arrives at your door in about a week. Shipping is 100% free. You have 100 nights to decide if you like it. Go to helixsleep.com slash BS and get $50 off your order. Thanks to HBO Now. You don't need cable. You don't need satellite to watch HBO. Download the HBO Now app and start your free one-month trial. That's the only way to watch After the Thrones. How can you miss my dude's Green Wild and Ryan? Just watch it. Thanks to The Ringer. Go to TheRinger.com to subscribe to our new newsletter. Um, we are over 175,000 subscribers getting great feedback for it. I'm going to be back with more podcasts later in the week. And House, we have to talk about playoff bets. Do you want to do a quick, very, very quick dissertation on why the Capitals are going to make the Stanley Cup Finals this year? I'll get, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you airspace right now if you want it. No, no. I, I, I don't have anything to say. It'll be a very short uh, summation. They, they, I, I'm hoping for the guys to get out there and get after it. Every single game's important. Each, each game, you just got to take it game by game. Uh, you put your head down. You get down on the ice when, when guys take shots, and that's it. That's it. Game by game. <laughs> Come on, boys. Wait, ben and I, my Let's son Ben, K, Giant Kings fan, we watched the Kings championship video that they had after they won in 2014, and his big takeaway was just imitating the coach, Daryl Sutter. He's like, come on, boys, let's go get him. Come on, guys. That's it. Get out there. Come on, guys, keep working. Let's go, boys. Come on. Uh, Sal and I made a Stanley Cup Finals bet, which we won last year. We won on Chicago and Tampa. And now we're back with another one. Do you want to hear what it is? I guess. Is this going to make you sad? Why do you sound well, so sad? Well, I have a futures bet out there, and I don't really want to talk about it because, you know, I've, I have a lot of history with this Washington team, and I love their position. I particularly love the characters on this team. Um, uh, TJ Oshie's been excellent. Williams is terrific. Um, and, and Holtby has been Holt Beast all season long. And I have all these good feelings, but I... I I've learned the hard way so many times um, 
to 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 invest anything come playoff time. So I'm just rooting for him game by game. But let me hear you what you and the cousin Sal did in terms of wagers. Well, one of the things I've learned is to uh, bet against all Washington teams in the playoffs. Sorry, it's a fu- okay. it's just a so fact. That's fine. Yeah, just win one, and then I, then I'll be scared. So uh, I love the fact that the Capitals are the consensus favorite because I know their history. So I looked at all the other Eastern Conference teams, and I've settled on the Panthers of Florida oh, as my representative. They have a nice mix of old guys and kind of in their prime guys and then blue chippers that are on their way up. And I don't know. I like the mix. I just like them. Can you name one player on their team? Aaron Ekblad, Willie Mitchell, Yaramir Yager. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay. Somebody – so I have the Kings coming out of the West. If the Kings don't come out of the West, it's their fault. They have the best team in the West, and they should come out of the West. And – they they are the most well rounded team. They have the most stars. Normally, you would say the Blackhawks, but you know my theory on um, on NHL. They're an every other year team. You can't you can't win the Stanley Cup and then come back and play another four rounds a year later. It's a suicide mission. You're playing 110 yeah. games to try to win the cup. So I I just think it's all set up for the Kings. They get to play the Sharks in round one. They get the Ducks in round two. The, the, That's the, going to be a disgusting. Blood group of scum the ducks worst <laughs> worst group of people on the earth ryan perry gets laugh Ugh, can't stand those guys that bxa Ugh, can't wait to i can't wait for my daughter to hurl f-bombs at them i'm gonna let her she's gonna be 11 soon uh and then the blackhawks potentially in round three what a great run that would be for the kings and then maybe your it's team. gonna be fun to watch maybe your team in the finals nhl playoffs are the best you sound so unconfident. It really actually makes me sad. I, I just don't have any confidence. You know why I don't sound confident? Because I don't have any. I'm excited for the start playoffs to start. I want to see what team comes out, and I want to see if we can build this, this build a little momentum here. The good news, it's like it's impossible for you to lose in round one. I don't feel that way. Who said that? I just think the, you're playing the Flyers, right? I know, but look, there's a lot They're of history terrible. between Washington and Philly. All right. They're terrible. They're not very good, but look, a lot of history. They're awful. I went to a game seven that the that the Caps did not win here in Washington, and Washington was favored over the Flyers. We should mention uh, you have a new podcast called Shack House, very successful golf podcast. And uh, on that podcast, you talked about the possibility of Danny Willett winning the Masters. You actually uh, uh, put a fake – wager on this if gambling was legal for $50 and you won at 50 to 1 odds. You won two. I did. I was very excited about that. The mo- fake dollars. Yeah. 2500 fake dollars. The best part of it was uh, Callaway Golf made the mistake of giving me um, control over their handle Wednesday uh, before the, the Masters got started on Thursday and somebody asked me what my favorite 50 to 1 bet was at that moment um, and I put in there Danny Willett so I felt like that was pretty pretty well validated i was disappointed for jordan uh because of how yeah dominant um he was with his own confessed b minus game yeah you know his t to green um game was so subpar uh, but he just had a triple plus putting all week long and then you know that the augusta has that 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 sneaky way of finding that flaw one one little swing flaw and exposing it and that's what happened on sunday i think the second shot the, after the drop, the shot he hit on 12 was the most shocking golf moment of my life. It was just <laughs> such a terrible shot. It was like for that guy to hit that shot where he took a divot that was seven feet long and just skunked it to the point Every, that the he turned of, away before he even went in the water. Incredible. Unbelievable. I still everybody, can't it. The it. With everybody's take is that's what I do. Yeah. I listened to, to Kornheiser a little bit Monday. That's what I do. I listen, you know, this, the, every podcast and golf writing afterwards. That's that's what the amateurs do. The first shot they made go to sense. a yard is it's uncomfortable. Yeah, the first shot made sense. He was trying to hit this, and all of a sudden it's in the water. The second shot was just a flat out scuff that guys with a forty handicap do, and it was just unbelievable. I watched with my dad. I actually got worried for my dad. My dad, like, oh no, my dad turned white, like he because he loves speed. He turned white, uh. and, and he was just like. 
oh no oh no like it, it was like we saw a car crash and he's still shaking like he texted me yesterday he's like i'll never forget watching that masters he's very upset about it anyway house. well there's a silver lining i there, there's a lot good record of guys coming back from catastrophes yeah, like that fine. and going yeah. on to be dominant he's great at golf he'll be fine uh house this was a yeah. pleasure good talking to you uh yeah. subscribe to the shack house Pod wednesday rolling yeah let's do it talk to you soon we are about this bitch Anytime y'all want to see me again, rewind this track right here, close your eyes, and picture me rolling.